Hello, Matrix Rife Nation. I've got the most famous farmer around, and what a privilege and honor it is to have Joel Salatin on the show. He's come to South Africa, and those that have really struggled with despair, and there's been a sense of absolute desperation with regards to the pandemic, uh, chronic disease, losing the war against chronic disease, there's going to be a lot of hope that's shared in this podcast. And so it's with privilege and with honor, a mighty man of God, a mighty warrior, who's been courageous for many years before it wasn't in vogue to be courageous about agriculture, about regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture. Welcome to the show, Joel Sellerton. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. Brilliant. Now, I normally introduce the guests, but I think there's just so much to you. You're an author, you're a farmer, you're a speaker, you're a man who just wants to break enslavement. Uh, I think yeah. that's what I get a sense from you, and I've seen you online and listen, it's about freedom. It's about freedom and breaking enslavement to debt, to finances, to big pharma, to these things that absolutely like enslave us to the things of this world. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who is Joel Salatin? <laughs> Who am I? <clears throat> well, I'm, a, I'm on a pilgrimage and, um, and I'm here. Uh, I guess the, the short answer now is um, I want to do all I can to offer hope and help when people feel hopeless and helpless, yeah, and uh, that's that's and there, there's a you mentioned it in the intro there. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of despair right now. People come up to me all the time and they say, "How do I disentangle? I just feel, I, I just feel tangled up yeah. um, in in things, and um, and it's just uh, it, it's a real it's a real need now uh, to be able to create." An alternative universe, yeah. uh, where we where we do come out from that entanglement. Sounds good, and I know that uh, Zach Bush is coming because you brought him here, which is exciting for next week. And it seems like there's a collective consciousness of rising up of people saying, "Okay, no more to the traditional order that's been around." I think COVID was a wake up call for many, many yes. people. You know, being a physician for 24 years, I've never seen so much anxiety, depression, despair, hopelessness in terms of the future. And, uh, some of the stats coming out of America, one in four Americans has, you know, multiple chronic diseases. Yes. Two in four, that's 50%, has at least one chronic disease. So, you know, if we look at sort of first world living, modernity, and what's happening. And America brought the world McDonald's. And the world, uh, you and, know, yeah, the, correct. There, there's a, uh, I, I could say, and America brought the world uh, McDonald's and Wall Street. And, and, and glyphosate. Yeah. And modern agriculture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, which glyphosate is yeah. a, certainly an, an yeah. example. I mean, it's just an example. Yeah. But um, yes, we, you know, we lead the world in things, but leading the world in chronic disease is, you like to be number one with your soccer yeah, team or yeah, your yeah, football yeah, team yeah, or yeah, your, yeah. right? Uh, you don't want to be number one mm. with your chronic disease. Yeah. And that's where America is right now. Mm. And, uh, and so, I mean, I, I love my country. I'm not, I'm not anti-American. I, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed mm. um, uh, about some of the things that we have mm. uh, brought to the world. And, and, and these things, you know, we. It has really struck me lately that now, especially in the rich, in the rich world, we have been now a couple of generations. Um, we, I mean, collectively, culturally, um, telling people. You know, if you just, you don't need to grow a garden, um, we'll let uh, Kellogg cereals take care of you. You don't need to, you don't need to um, milk a cow, you know, we'll let the, the, the milk people take care of you. Uh, you, don't need, you don't need to work in your kitchen even. We'll let uh, Hot Pockets and uh, TV dinners and prefab mm -hmm. food, uh, you know, squeezable Velveeta cheese, that'll all take care of you. And, and, and it's all been done kind of in a name of, let's free... Let's free you up from, from the decision-making drudgeries of life so that you have time to go to the theater, uh, patronize the Kardashians, you know, whatever, right? Go on your cruise. It's been promised as liberation. liberation. And now suddenly, with the war in U Ukraine and fertilizer four times as expensive and... and the things that, the things that they were promised. I mean, pro promised farmers, um, you don't have to deal with, you know, with your soil. Uh, just just get a bag of this and mm. put it on, and everything will be fine. 
And so in all of these respects, we've been promised liberation. Mm -hmm. But suddenly what we've found is that the ones who continued to grow their gardens, can their food, um, um, grind their grain, bake their bread, make their own sourdough, mm -hmm. uh, people like, like me who continued to um, compost uh, at a large scale mm -hmm. rather than buying chemical fertilizer, guess what? We wake up suddenly and we're the ones that are actually freed up. I think the message is, the message is that we were told you can have liberty, you can be freed from, from the drudgeries of life by not participating. And now we know the only way to actually get freedom yeah. in your life is to participate. Yeah. That's fundamental. You have to participate in, in, in your food, your medical, your recreation, your entertainment, your relationships, your marriage, your... They don't... You can't put life on autopilot. It's consistent work yes, day right. in, day that's out. Right. It's not about the convenience of now, which that's is actually right. the faster car, the faster food, the faster entertainment. We want it now. We don't want to work for it. That's right. We don't want to actually look at our farms, our patches, and make sure that we can consistently and organizationally come together so that we can produce our own food, which is the best for us. Yeah, we that, handed that accountability to big food, big mm -hmm. farmer, big agriculture. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and we even, you know, Sir Albert Howard said it when he wrote uh, an agricultural testament in 1943 and uh, essentially brought to the world the uh, scientific formula for aerobic composting. He said every civilization is tempted to take what nature took centuries to, to millennia to create soil and and turned into cash, and of course, and that's what we've done. We we haven't we haven't nurtured. We've exploited. Uh, we we've, we've walked around. We've walked around our, our health, our microbiome, our all these things like a bunch of swaggering mm -hmm. conquistador pirates, right? And and um, and assume that we can manipulate, we can exploit, we can override, and then we find out, ooh, it actually does matter. Um, what is in our microbiome? Oh, it actually does matter um, whether we whether we forgive or live a life of, of vengeful mm -hmm. vengeful retribution. Um, you know, it, it does it yeah, does affect it. us. And so, you know, when when COVID hit, the thing about COVID was that you know things like that, crises like that, never make trends. They simply they simply bring into focus yeah. trends that are already there, and so I, th I think that's that's where um, that's what COVID did to us as well. And so you know, I was waiting for some some government somewhere in the world, anywhere, I didn't care where, um, to, to for for the you know the health minister to stand up and say, "Okay, everybody, here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend a month doing an experiment. Everybody with me? Good. Here's what we're going to do. We're gonna we're going to work on our immune systems for one month." So the first thing we're going to do is um, we're we're not going to eat any uh, any fat fast food for a month. Uh, we're going to actually cook from scratch. We're not going to eat any high fructose corn yeah. syrup stuff for a month. Um, we're going to um, we're going to get out in the sun mm -hmm. for at least twenty minutes a day. Get all that good you know vitamin D. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to work up a sweat twenty minutes a day. You know move yeah. get 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 some. Get your toxins out, you know. Yep. Get some good sweat going on. Um, we're going to uh, drink uh, whatever uh, a liter and a half of water a day. Everybody's dehydrated. Uh, your body runs on water, so we need to drink drink some water. Um, we're going to um, uh, we're going to sleep for at least eight hours a night. You're not going to stay up late and watch the TV. Yep. You're going to go to bed. We're going to sleep for eight hours a night. Because you know we're all sleep deprived. Um, instead of watching the news for two hours a day, we're going to watch the news one hour a week, and and uh, and spend an hour a day watching um, nothing but comedy. We're, we're going to yeah. laugh. Yeah. We're we're, we're going to laugh ourselves. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're going to we're going to laugh ourselves silly, and then um, and then and then the final thing is that um, we're going to we're going to everybody's going to make a list of all the people 
that you that you hate or despise, and you're going to forgive them. Beautiful. What 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 would have happened? It would be a different world. It, it, it would really be a different world, wouldn't it? If somebody yeah. had said, "This is this is going to be our recipe," uh, instead of a bunch of you know trial. Uh, but that's why I'm so excited, Joel. Like people like yourself, like Farmer Angus that I interviewed this morning, because I think the power is going to be with the people and not government, and I don't want to get yes. into politics, yes, but it's yes. not in their best interest to stand up and do that. Not a single health minister did it. Not no. a single health minister said, we want to empower you to improve your situation. Go right. and give your loved one that you're living in the house with a big hug and release oxytocin. Make sure that you're <laughs> physically in contact because mm -hmm. that is so good for your right. immune system. Right. Get outside together, eat together, look mm -hmm. at one another. No one was saying that because it's not in their best interest. Now, I'm not saying they're not good, godly people within government, but right. just the systems there, yeah. unfortunately, are not in place to empower the person like you and me mm -hmm. and our communities to rise up because they're really concerned about enslavement and really seeing us as a resource and mining us and not having us thrive, just survive for their big industry. Yeah, well, well, fear, um, fear is a wonderful control factor. And so, I mean, here we are, we're talking about uh, disentangling. And, and when, you're, when you're bound up in fear, you can't think properly, yeah. you can't reason properly. Uh, when you're in, in fight or flight, you know, you're, you're not thinking through things. And so uh, this, this constant media and, and whatever, governmental ha uh, uh, diet of you've got to fear this, fear that, fear, I mean, farmers, you know, you have to fear this fungus, fear this avian, high path avian influence. If you have chickens, you've got to fear, you know, uh, African swine flu. If you've got pigs, you've got to fear, you know, hoof and mouth and, and brucellosis if you have cows and you it's a constant message of fear, and when you have this constant message of fear, people, um, people consistently uh, look for some sort of a security, some sort of an answer, and, and, and it drives you away from a life of faith that, uh, you know, whether it's God or whether it's just, you know, on our farm, we believe very strongly that that nature is fundamentally um, functions very well, and and so if I'm sick or if I have an animal that's sick or if I have a plant that's sick, uh, that's a plant that's not doing well. Um, <laughs> I, I, my first assumption is not that oh there are some some evil things out there, yeah. you know, making my thing sick. My first question is I look in the mirror and say, so what did you do? override the immune system of the tomato yeah. the the apple the cow the pig the, the, myself and and we find uh, that by asking that question we actually we actually um, learn a lot more about truth than just assuming oh well I guess I guess I just didn't use the right concoction. Yeah. I guess I just didn't use the right thing. I don't have the right fertilizer, the right yeah, herbicide, yeah. the right yeah. fungicide. Right, There's right. something I'm missing. That's right. In fact, we were the instigator that caused that sickness in yes. the environment. That, that's exactly right. And and that's that's a very different mindset uh, to assume to assume that nature's default position is health. That that's a that's a a real mental paradigm shift. Because I can assure you that in the in the seats of food and farming power today and health services, the fundamental assumption is nature is fundamentally flawed, yeah. and there are real flaws, and we've got to we've got to fix it. We've got to fix it with yeah. this vaccine, that thing, that the other thing. And we, the the greatest intelligence to fix that, because we know better than nature's. Right? right, right, yeah. exactly, exactly. I want to move on to a couple of stories, and as I speak, there's maybe a story of a farmer whose life changed through regenerative agriculture. We will define that term because I think it's important because a lot of people don't understand what that is or what organic means. But a story of a farmer whose life has changed not only with regards to their farm, but what happens if you change the farm to regenerative agriculture plus there's a social connection between nature and human beings. It ends up being financially viable because I know that that is a huge concern for a lot of people. So if you can think of a story of, that you can share, 
because people relate to a lot of stories. That's the first thing. And the second story would be someone whose health was maybe just like riddled with disease or a family that was riddled with disease mm -hmm. or people that started eating from biodynamic regenerative agricultural farms whose lives changed without pharmaceuticals so that the person listening out there or watching on YouTube can say, hang on, I'm a farmer, there's another way forward. In fact, if I can follow these principles, and I know you're doing the masterclass on the weekend, which is incredible, and up in Bella Bella, and I've sent some of my people on my team, because I think it's just the way of the future. There's a lot of hope there. Sure, you know, sure. spending time with Farmer Angus and just seeing how the people came together and he saw one another in a circle. It was about the people and the environment. It was about the nature and the people the whole time working in the symbiotic relationship was crucial. So maybe share a couple of stories yeah, that people well, can relate well, to. Well, certainly, I mean, certainly the, my, the best story is just our farm itself. And when we came in 1961, my mom and dad bought the farm. I was just four. And, um, and it, was, it, was a, it was the armpit of the community. I mean, it was a rock pile, uh, uh, gullied. We had 16-foot deep gullies. Uh, we'd lost five feet of topsoil since the Europeans came. And, uh, and it, I mean, it was the most worn out place. And I remember as a child being able to walk the entire farm and never set foot on a piece of vegetation. It was that barren, uh, very, very barren. And, um, and, and we, we could really you know, not even support, I don't know what, 12, 15 cows. It was quite poor. And, um, and, and over a lifetime now, we've turned it into arguably the, the most productive, um, uh, the, the best farm in the community. I don't say that proudly. I say that very humbly and gratefully that the principles of, of uh, building the soil, moving the animals around, multi-speciation, stacking different animals on, on the ground uh, at, at different times, um, all, all, uh, building ponds. You know, we ins we've installed um, uh, 15 kilometers of, uh, of underground um, water pipe that feeds from permaculture style high ponds up in the up in the mountain um, that, that that brings water down under pressure you know without any electricity or pumps uh, so you know these these are all things that were available to anybody at the time I think that's that's the critical thing you know I'm at the age now where looking back I'm realizing um, uh, Every every year, Dad gets smarter. <laughs> yeah. in, in my in my mind, yeah. I mean, he's he's passed away long ago. But um, but to, to to see what he saw in those early days that the the chemical um, the chemical approach is like a is like a uh, like a rat race. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to run yourself into fertility, but you can never do it in a bag of 10, yeah. 10, 10 chemical fertilizer. It takes carbon decomposition. And so that, you know, that basic concept um, put us into, you know, composting and moving the animals around, uh, you know, growing the perennial and, and actually focusing on that. So, you know, that uh, being able to see that, that transformation, to see big places, uh, you know, um, an eighth of a hectare that were nothing but rock, solid rock, wouldn't even grow a weed. And to see today that has, you know, yay, uh, topsoil. Um, and we had so little topsoil when we came to the farm that um, Dad poured concrete in tires, pushed half-inch pipes in it to put electric fence stakes in because we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. It doesn't take much soil to hold up an electric fence stake, you know. And so... In my lifetime, I've been able to see this go from rock to, you know, yay. So now it, it, it's not it's not, you know, three feet like it was um, 500 years ago, but it's you know it's that much, and to see that is truly is truly amazing, and so. Uh, and so, tell us about the production because your production now, I've listened to a lot of your talks in that, your production is greater than your traditional farmer who's using traditional agriculture oh, methods. So your tonnage in terms of yes, cattle, they yes. call cow days from what I remember. Yes, yes. And that is very important You're for the person really listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I've checked you out. Yeah. <laughs> cow days. Yeah, cow days. Yeah. So, so our uh, a cow day is what one cow will eat in a day. And um, so in our county, the average is 80 cow days per acre. In other words... Um, uh, one acre will support 80 cows for one day a year or one cow for 80 days a year. 
and we're averaging 400 cow wow. days per wow. acre. That's we've never tons. we've never planted a seed, wow. and we've taken our organic matter from 1% to 8%. Realize that every 1% increase in organic matter, it holds an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre. Yeah. So, um, so we've, we've gone from 1 to 8, so that's 7%, 7 uh, times 20,000 is 140,000 gallons of water per acre that we can now hold that we couldn't hold way back. That means when you get a lot of excess rain, it doesn't flood as quickly. It means when things start to dry out, it doesn't dry out as quickly. You know, because, because organic matter is like a sponge. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's the spongy, uh, it's also the, 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 uh, the detoxifier, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that organic matter help, uh, describes all of that, um, that carbonaceous, you know, microbial life in, in the soil. And that's right. worth, like I had Dr. Stephanie Seneff on the show talking about glyphosate and how pernicious and how pervasive it is in America. That's probably, she says, in some uh, counties, it's 80% in the air and the water, glyphosate, this water sodium right. is in the water table. You producing that, maybe at 60% of air and water, you're still able to have this very biodiverse ecosystem right. Despite all the toxins and chemicals, like 50,000 right. toxins that have been added to our environment yeah. in the last 80 years, you're still able to overcome that. Yeah, yeah. Na nature's number, uh, you know, two number one uh, detoxicants are number one, organic matter in the soil, and, and, the, and the second one is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, you know, is, is, a, is a detoxifier. And so if you can grow more green material, more vegetation, and you can get your organic matter up, then you actually create a a a a a, uh, a buffer yeah. uh, in, in the in, in the natural system. That's incredible. And, and so, um, what's been exciting is now that I've begun writing about this, speaking about it. You know, I have a file. I don't know that thick. It's it's just hundreds and hundreds of letters and testimonials from people who who said uh, a. I mean, it's everything from I was trapped in a city job and wishing. I could grow something, and there are a lot of people who would like to farm, but they they've been told by everyone that it's impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, no guidance counselor in high school tells a, an honors student, "Wow, Mary, uh, you have such good grades. You're so smart. You should be a farmer." Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. nobody says that, and so there. So our world is full of people in in Dilbert cubicles working at the end of an expressway, punching numbers into cyberspace for, mm. for the man um, who would love to be growing things, who would love to have calluses and splinters and, and do things. But they've never been, they've never been affirmed in that. They've, they've never, that's never been an, a real option. It's never been encouraged because the American no. dream is about having a high street job and Absolutely. making a lot of money with big yeah. cars and everybody else is working for you while yeah. you're sitting in the Bahamas yeah. setting up So King Sun. Failure to participate. Yeah. Failure to participate. That's exactly, you just hit the nail on the head. And so, so, um, so th these people have, 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 have been able to come out and do that. Others, uh, we were farming, we were losing money, we didn't know what to do. We started some of these things, and sure enough, they work, they work. <laughs> and, uh, and we're now farming full time, we're debt free, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing well. So, uh, I mean, I, I just have a, a list of those. There are just uh, thousands of those people who have been able to... Who now, those are farmers. Maybe that. you can share with people that are listening out there, you know, that we all farmers by proxy, speaking to that, where we buy from, those decisions we make, who we buy from, sure. you know, whether we actually grow ourselves a little patch, a little permaculture patch there. But let's talk about maybe some stories of people, you know, Zach Bush was saying that one in two people is going to get cancer in their lifetime, sure. which is just absolutely crazy, He's saying we've got 60 to 70 years of topsoil left, you know, so these mm -hmm. things are real red flags out there, but maybe well, give are. us a bit of a, a story yeah, you know, of people. <laughs> you know, there's an old Chinese saying that says, um, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to end up where you're headed. And, and, and these trajectories are not good. Uh, and, and, and I mean, in the U.S. now, for the first time, life expectancy is dropping. The actual uh, actuarials for life expectancy are dropping. Um, so uh, so uh, one, of, one of the best uh, people I know that has a, a wonderful story mm. like this is uh, my co-author of the book Beyond Labels, Dr. Yeah. Cena McCullough. So here's a here's a you know a PhD um, with a, with a uh, emphasis in nutrition. Okay, college, and um, and and she gets a, a, an autoimmune disease. You know, early in her you know in her early twenties, 
And uh, by the time she was 31, um, they were planning her funeral. They thought she was going to die. She, she couldn't get off the floor. She, she had everything wrong with, with her that you can imagine. And no doctors could help her. She went, you know, everything that you can imagine. And finally, uh, her husband said, um, you know, you have to quit blaming this on somebody else. You, you, have, you have to decide, you decide, have to decide what you're going to do about it. And so she completely uh, flipped her paradigm and said, it's not up to the doctors, it's up to me. And she started taking what she knew in her PhD in nutrition and turning it on its head. And, um, and within, uh, you know, within three years, uh, she was from planning her funeral to uh, within five years, she was uh, pregnant with another child. And is just a bubbly, vivacious, you know, uh, uh, lady today. And, and, um, and she did it through, um, through, first of all, realizing that her health was her responsibility. It's not, it's, it's not the minister of health. It's not the medical profession. It's not the doctor. Um, and and I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, talk down doctors. Look, if I cut my arm off, I want to, I want a good trauma doctor to, you know, to, to deal with that. But Western modern medicine is not good at non-infectious chronic things, cancer, Alzheimer's, yeah. diabetes, yeah. the chronic stuff. Yeah, the, the chronic stuff. So here in in the in in the rich countries, we've exchanged the infectious diseases like you know typhus and and uh, um, you know those kinds of things. We've exchanged those for the non-infectious, and um, and our non-infectious is is is, is primarily lifestyle, yeah. lifestyle stuff. And uh, so she started, you know, she started, she quit going to the grocery store. Um, in, in that journey early on, you know, we were not friends. She, in her research, she found us. So she started finding, well, where's the good food? Where's the good food? And um, so, you know, she started eating our, our food. She started, um, you know, reducing her grain consumption, um, uh, you know, different things. But anyway, uh, she did. She did cure herself, and um, I, I deal with a lot of uh, health coaches around the country. Uh, health coaches, again, they're having amazing, amazing success. Um, going at it from a, I, I, I just can't emphasize this enough. At the first step is, is I'm not going to blame somebody else, yeah. or or um, assume that somebody else has responsibility. Yeah. I'm going to take that accountability myself. Yes. My I'm exercise, my that's relationships. Right. That's right. You know, my family, that's right. that's my right. movement, just everything. My food, yeah. I'm going to take accountability. Even, even, those people, even those people that I hate, that's too strong a word, but, but you, know, the, uh, they, you know, even those people, you can't control what yeah, they do. Exactly. You can't control what they say. Yeah. You know, maybe they're in their family. Yeah. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's... <laughs> you know, whatever Maybe they're it is. eating McDonald's all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But 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 you can't control yeah. them, yeah. but you can control your response Correct. to them. Yeah. And, uh, and and that's where I think this this mm. this freeing up. Um, but you've got a passion uh, now for really regenerative. Helps agriculture so talk us through that what that actually means and maybe you want to define organic and biodynamic yeah because I think these are important concepts to someone's listening yeah yeah well they are and and so so you know early on when people started the, the buzzwords have changed it used to be sustainable ag and then it was other things and so uh, I, I kind of finally came up with with my definition of all this is um, what are, are, are the children attracted to it or, or put away from it? The ultimate test of, of longevity is succession. Is it something that the next generation wants to do? And in farming, we've had a, a, a terrible um, uh, whatever trajectory right now in that children who grow up on farms, excuse me, don't, don't want to farm. Uh, they want to go to the cities. They want to go to the cities. And that's the American dream. How many yeah. stories, how many yeah. movies? Oh, I grew up in this small town farming, and Absolutely. now I'm just going to the big city, go and yeah. study, become a big attorney, these yeah. type of... Yeah, and, and, and sure, not everybody's going to grow up and stay on the farm. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I totally get that, all right? But, um, 
but it, it, it should not be it should not be something that that pushes people away. Um, it should be something. Yes, I'm attracted to it, but I really I really just want to be a diesel mechanic, or I want to yeah. you know whatever, be an architect. Uh, that's fine. And and so um, mainline agriculture has become you know uh, economically problematic. It's become um, uh, you know, health problematic. If you go to any uh, normal farm, a conventional farm convention now, ninety <clears throat> percent of the discussion is about diseases. Ninety percent um, in, in crop ground, it's about weeds, it's about fungus and molds and 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 wilt, fusarium, whatever uh, wilt, uh, but but all sorts of problems, and uh, and so. In, in regenerative, organic, biodynamic, in our in our world, ecological, um, uh, in, in our world, what we focus on is health. How do we how do we optimize health? So, thinking through the through the strata, it starts with health in the soil, yeah. and it still amazes me that the soil that one one handful of soil um, has like five billion beings in it, and they're they're interacting. I always like to think about the Star, the Star Trek, you know, where, uh, where um, Luke Skywalker right. walks in to find this, this transport, this intergalactic transport, and he meets uh, Han Solo for yeah. the first time. And you got all these, you know, these weird, they, blah, 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 you know, in this, in this cap, yeah. space cafe. And that's why I see the soil, all these, you know, two-headed, three-legged beings, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and hey, I've, I've got a, I've got a, a, a um, a molecule of molybdenum. Yeah. I'll trade you for that polysaccharide, yeah. you know. And it's just kind of this, this interaction. Yeah, this underground cafe. Yeah. Um, and, and then here comes one, and he walks in, you know, and he's got pincers, and he walks up to somebody and plops her head off, you know, and, and eats it. While uh, it, 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 it's just this this amazing. Um, I like to think of it as a cathedral cathedral with all these rooms of activity going on. Some have hydrogen, some have oxygen, some have a, you know, an acetobacter, a mycelium, mm -hmm. uh, an actinomycetes, you know, and they're all, you know, interacting in this kind of um, sloshy cathedral half filled, you know, with rooms and aggregate in there, uh, in, in the soil, uh, you know, a, a glomulan mm -hmm. atmosphere. Um, so, so there's this, this, this amazing place. And so, as a farmer, my primary duty is to grow the soil. So there's more there when I leave than there was when I started. Well, how do we how do we build soil? We build soil with carbon decomposition. The sun shines, and and the sun um, is metabolized into fungible fungible uh, uh, carbon uh, through photosynthesis. And so, you know, I still think it's amazing that something is as mystical and esoteric as sunbeams mm. through photosynthesis gets converted into into plant material that you can weigh, hold, measure, sell, you know, tradable mm. fungible material uh, uh, carbon and <clears throat> and that carbon then either is eaten by uh, um, an animal and comes out as manure and urine so it decomposes there or it's eaten by microbes and it decomposes there the, the point is that that carbon then that is the food that drives the entire stomach of the earth, which is in the soil. And, and so it's not driven by 10-10-10 chemical fertilizer. It's not driven by pesticides, herbicides. It's driven by carbon decomposition. So everything we've done on our farm is about how do we get, how do we get more carbon on the soil? How do we protect the carbon in the soil? How do we grow the carbon in the soil? And and that's that's the end. Is that regenerative agriculture in your words there, as you said it? Yeah, yeah. So it, it grows the soil. All right. So then, then as you grow the soil, then but it doesn't stop there. Now we have to actually be economically viable. Um, and in and farming, uh, you know, we've kind of got four um, in in the food and food sector. We've got four things that that the retail dollar. Uh, goes to, if you, if you think about what you spend at the grocery store, uh, the, the final uh, product, some of it goes to the producer, some of it goes to a processor, some of it goes to distribution, some of it goes to marketing. So you got these four entities, marketing, distribution, processing, and production. Well, the average farmer 
is only getting production money, not getting you know, the, the, the famous middleman, yeah. all right, the middleman. And so we realized as a small farm, we needed to wear those middleman hats. We needed, we needed to embrace and, and start getting some of those middleman uh, dollars. Those dollars also, by the way, are the ones that are immune to the vagaries, or pretty much immune to the vagaries that farmers are susceptible to. Uh, I call them the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, weather, price, pestilence, and disease, right? That's what every farmer sits on the back of his truck or in the cafe and, 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 and complains about, weather, price, pestilence, and disease. And so the more dollars, if we start, if we start taking some of the processing, if we start taking some of the marketing, some of the distribution, those dollars are immune to weather, price, pestilence, yeah. and disease. The grasshoppers don't eat the stainless steel processing table. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And so, uh, so economic viability means that we have to, we have to create margins that, that create profitability because young people won't stay. Again, I'm going back to uh, young people won't stay if there's no economic uh, possibility for them. And so, uh, so uh, you know, the, the economy is, is important. Mm. And, and then, you know, and then the whole emotional thing. I mean, uh, uh, emotional or, or, or uh, you know, relational relational stuff, and you know, does that next generation feel feel wanted? Feel um, like they can make a contribution? Feel valued because feel, every single person needs to feel, be valued. Feel valued, yeah. yeah. And, and farmers, you know, farmers as a group, um, you know, tend to be kind of loners. I mean, farming is lonely. You're, you know, you're out in the field a lot, right? And, and so, uh, so farm, farming tends to attract people who just put their head down and, and you know, in, in uh, personality tra traits, uh, we call them ants. Mm -hmm. They just, I just get out here and work, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, and so as, as the next generation comes up, uh, they need to feel like they have decision-making power some autonomy, some ability to, to germinate there. And, uh, and farmers notoriously are, are, are not, real, uh, not real open to the ideas of their children. Okay. You know, uh, that doesn't work. That doesn't work here, whatever. And so uh, we have done a lot at our place. My dad and mom did it with me is to, um, is to, to, give those children opportunities early on to have entrepreneurial contributions uh, where, that they own yeah. uh, so that they can, so that they can. Otherwise the contribute. father's running the farm at 94 and yes. the kid's just a slave there. Yes. You know, just a like, absolutely. and then he's got no value and he's like, yeah. I'm out of here because yeah. this guy's never going to let control. We absolutely. can't do this. We can't yeah. do that. Yeah. So the biggest blessing of my life is I can be here today yeah. and our son mm -hmm. is completely running day-to-day -day operations and I'm, I'm the least important person there yeah. now from yeah. a day-to-day -day operation yeah, standpoint. You. So um, now that's powerful. That's it, legacy. That's taking yeah. what you've learned and transforming it to the next yes. generation or transferring. That's it. right. So when we talk about regenerative, often people just people are, are only thinking ecological regeneration, but you can't have viable, authentic ecological regeneration without having the the, the people the people regeneration up above it and the economic regeneration. So our, our mission statement at Polyface is to develop um, emotionally, ecologically, and economically enhancing proto agriculture prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. Wow. And so, so it's those three, it's those three elements. E that emotionally, develop. ecologically, and economic. economically. Wow. That's right, that's right. Um, I mean, emotionally would be, um, you know, kind of social, yeah. But I need to have three E's. I mean, it's, it's yeah, and it works. Seven. It works for you. <laughs> Emotional, ecological, and economic. Mm -hmm. and, and if if you violate any three, any one of those three, everything starts to break down. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you can have you can have the best farm in the world, but if you come in the house, and and there's a war going on in the house, 
uh, it's, it's not going to work. Or your grandkids hate your grandfather because he never spends time with you. There's an emotional right. disconnect. Right. That emotional disconnect says, I'll never do what granddad's doing. I'm out of here as soon as I can. So yeah. I get that. Yeah. But let's talk about the American situation before we move to the African situation. You've got mm -hmm. mainstream agriculture farmers. Is that changing significantly? Was COVID or the war in Ukraine? How many farms are like sort of trance? forming their farms to regenerative agriculture. What is the trend? What's happening? Well, you know, I, I, think, I think the best way to look at this is that, that things are happening on both ends of the spectrum. Um, so on, on the one end, we have a, a literal, um, I, I call it a tsunami of homesteading. I'm not going to use farming. These are, in other words, uh, when, when, look, when supply chains broke down and there was no food on the grocery store shelves and people are concerned about the economics and uh, social unrest in the cities and whatever, there is a, there is a, a migration right now of urban to rural. Uh, that, that, is, that is ongoing and it's huge. Uh, urban real estate prices are collapsing. Uh, rural real estate prices have risen 200% in the last 24 months. So, so, uh, so that there are there are people coming out to this now. They're primarily homesteaders, you know, small scale, uh, basically looking to, um, again, decouple and be self reliant. Yeah. Um, but but that has always throughout history that has always been a precursor to scaling up. You start with your prototype, and the ones who really like it are going to scale up and, and move forward with it, and the ones who don't won't. Now. What's, what's uh, wonderful about that side of the spectrum, and we'll talk about the other side in a minute, but what's exciting about that side of the spectrum is that there is so much land becoming available. You know, the average American farmer is now 60 years old. And so we know that in the next 15 years, this is according to the, you know, the, the agriculture colleges and stuff that study these things, in the next 15 years, half of all American agriculture equity is going to change hands. That's that's land, buildings, and equipment. Wow. Half of it is going to change hands in the next 15 years. Now, historically, no civilization has ever gone through that amount of agrarian equity change that rapidly, except in conquest. Now, I'm not here telling you America's getting ready to be conquested. Okay, <laughs> I don't know if the Huns are coming tomorrow or not. But um, but, but but the fact is, these are uncharted waters historically. Uh, no culture has had that, that big a change in agriculture equity. What that means, though, is that there's a, a, a time of unprecedented opportunity for people who know how to do something with land. Uh, land is just becoming available. It's becoming open. Um, so that, that's the one end of the spectrum that's extremely exciting. The other end of the expect, spectrum, of course, is what I would call the, you know, the agriculture industrial complex. And it is continuing to centralize. Uh, on my way to the airport to fly here to South Africa, I was listening to an ad by uh, one of the I don't know, Cargill, Tyson, uh, one of the big chicken companies. Uh, you know, we need people, farmers to sign up to have these great big factory chicken houses. And you know what? There's there's farmers signing up every day to have these great big factory chicken houses. And so um, so so the the centralization and the scale of those is a is certainly um, they, the, the system has not begun to question the underpinnings of its, of its thing. Now, what's interesting about, about what COVID did was, that, I mean, we certainly saw it on our farm. You know, we direct market, and we've always been accused of being elitist, you know, because we don't sell our food as, as, as cheap as what's in the store because the store doesn't, doesn't account for a lot of external costs. Yeah. Um, you know, water pollution, MRSA, C. diff, superbugs, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and nobody's going to get any of that from our food. And so we've always been accused of being elitist and all that. Well, a couple months ago, I'm there in the farm store, and a lady, you know, kind of looks at the meat counter, and she gasps. And I said, well, can, can I help you? What's up? And she said, uh, she said oh, my goodness, um, your sirloin steak is $9.99 a pound. And I was just at Costco, and there, they're $16.99 a pound. Wow. And it struck me, and I realized that what's happened here is that that with the that as as things become dysfunctional, the war in Ukraine, price of fertilizer, 
uh, supply chain problems, energy costs, um, uh, the, um, human, human resources, the HR departments, as HR departments swell in big business mm. um, dealing with, you know, quarantine and, and personal, you know, health issues. And shareholders still want to make their $2 million yeah. despite those right, circumstances. Right, right. Yeah. So what's happened is that as things, as the food, the food sector has, um, has entered these, I'll just call them rocky, rocky shoals, okay, during times of, of uh, black swans and strange events, uh, you don't want to be in an aircraft carrier. You want to be in a speedboat, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. where you can get Agile around. Agile and nimble. A a nimble, that's right, nimble. There's even a business book out now that you know, it says, um, it's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. And it's all about being nimble. And so I realized, you know what? You know, on our farm we have whatever, you know, 25 of us. I don't wake up in the morning and wonder, oh no, who's going to turn us into the government agency because we didn't have the right quarantine procedure? Who, you know, who, who uh, I got to write protocols today for the right, uh, for, you know, and find out who had COVID in the last month, whatever. Um, I don't wake up in the morning and think about those kinds of things. But big businesses do. That, that completely consumes, yeah. and their, their HR departments have swelled, whatever. And so what's happened is that, that the, the big uh, aircraft carriers have suddenly become more fragile in a disruptive system. And we smaller entities that are running our little speedboat, yeah. we have ended up being more resilient. And so the, the efficiency that the big guys always, we're, we're efficient, yeah. you're not efficient, we're efficient, we're efficient. Suddenly now, efficiency has been replaced with resiliency because everybody's starting to realize if we're not first resilient, if we don't first survive, there's nothing to be efficient yeah. about. There's no produce. That's right, there, there, there's nothing to be efficient about. And so that, that's a very, it's a, it's a fascinating place. You know, I, I ask people in, in the U.S., I say, let me ask you this. In the spring of 2020, when COVID hit and everything locked down and the stores were empty of food and people were panicking, do you think that we would have weathered that catastrophe, that crisis? Um, would we have weathered it better if instead of having 300 5,000 person mega processing facilities funneling food into our system, if instead we had had 300,000 neighborhood okay. abattoirs, canneries, processors, funneling food, which would have been able to survive that better? Yeah. And every, I haven't had a single person yeah. yet yeah. say, oh, uh, you know, I think we'd have done better if we'd have had instead of 300, yeah. 100. No, they all say the, uh, that that adds resilience. And so uh, so we're, we're very, uh, I've never been more optimistic about, um, about our our uh, authenticity to meet the needs of the food and fiber industry as I am today um, because of this new understanding within the system of, uh, of, of fragility within the system. And so, um, you know, per perhaps we need to start calling ourselves, you know, even beyond regenerative, resilient. Yeah. Regenerative, know. resilient. Yeah, yeah. Where, where are we in that, that resilient, uh, that resilient equation? And, you know, e even things. I mean, you read you know, the business uh, journal. I mean, I read a lot of business stuff, and uh, you know, the the mantra for the last whatever forty years has been just in time inventory, right? Just in time. That you know, lean it out and get it. You know, just in time. Now it's just in case. And everybody's hoarding. Maybe we better have more toilet paper. Maybe we better have a pantry full of, you know, uh, of food. Maybe we better buy a freezer and 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 get more. Uh, it, it's all about building redundancy and resiliency within the system, and that that is a healthy change. That is a healthy change.
We're coming to the end of the show, but two things I want you to talk about, how important animals are and rotating sort of areas of grazing. I was with Angus today looking at his hens and how he moves the egg mobiles and what happens with their droppings and how they are as manure. So talk right. about the animals because I think there's this whole vegan movement and, sure. you know, there's pros and cons. I think I've seen healthy vegans. They eat really good plant-based, not industrialized, processed, you know, plants. I think there is a place, but that animals are not depleting our soils. Animals are not destroying our environment, which is a lot of the meme that's out there. And it's really, really common of, you know, these people that are omnivores and, you know, the omnivore di dilemma and how important that is. Because I think that's a narrative, mm -hmm. like, that people still believe about what animals are doing to our planet. Yes, yes. Well, uh, if you look at animals in nature, they exhibit three things. Um, they're moving and they're mobbing or flocking or herding or whatever, but they're but they're mobbed up for predator protection and things and then they're, they're mowing you know they're they're mowing uh, they're they're pruning they're 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 eating uh, veg, plant material and so moving mobbing mowing is kind of the the three m's of natural uh, e uh, of, of of animal ecosystems you've got three e's and three m's three That's e's and three m's yeah <laughs> moving mobbing mowing and so uh, so any domestic livestock program, including poultry, that, that abridges any one of those three, moving, mobbing, mowing, anyone that abridges one of those three turns the animal asset into an animal liability. And the truth is that 98 point whatever something percent of the domestic livestock on the planet violate at least one of those three. They're either not moving, not mobbing, or not mowing. They're 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 doing they're they're really doing something else, and um, and so the 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 studies that impugn the livestock industry are coming from a from a very um, a prejudicial uh, standpoint in that they're studying a broken system, and when you study a broken system. Uh, and that and that becomes your data point. Uh, you know, you're going to come up with with incorrect conclusions. It's like it's like if you and I were from Pluto and we're looking at the Earth and saying, you know, let's go down and study their education program. Maybe we you know, we learn something from the way they you know they teach their kids. So you and I jump in a flying saucer. We come down to the planet, you know, Earth and we land in a schoolyard that's administered by the worst superintendent in the worst school district. And the school has the worst principal. And we go visit the worst classroom with the mm. worst teacher yeah. in the country. And we go back to Pluto. They say, well, what'd you find out? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. If we had, you know, uh, they'd be better if they didn't have any education at all. Yeah. Right? That's what we would conclude. And so when you use data points that are incorrect, which then you come to incorrect conclusions. And so what, what you know, when things like, you know, um, Cow conspiracy, or, or um, uh, you know, and in uh, what the health, you know, when these documentaries are, are done and push people to the vegan alternative, uh, they are using data points from a dysfunctional system, and to promote the ideology. Well, whether it's to, to promote it to in, in ignorance, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say that they mm -hmm. have a bad intention. Yeah. Um, that's where I break with a lot of my friends. They think all these people are evil intended. No, 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 no. Let's not talk about intention. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that everybody is well intended, but some, but, but some people uh, just don't have. They're just looking at the, the wrong data. They're, yeah, looking they're looking at the, at the wrong, wrong and analyzing the wrong, the wrong yeah, data. Analyzing the wrong data. Now, certainly, some people do have an agenda. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Certainly, sure. but I find that in my discussions with people who disagree with me, I get a lot farther assuming that that you're well intended. Yeah. Than assuming that you're evil intended, uh, yeah. we, we just have a better discussion. So uh, you know, so so that the fact is, there is no animalist ecology, and animals provide this wonderful function. One in nature, a lot of people don't think about is that in nature, animals are the only way to move fertility anti gravitational. So, if there were no animals. Everything would be gravita the minerals, the leaves, the twigs, the carbon, everything would be gravitationally moving 
from high ground to low ground, okay? But animals in nature tend to uh, eat in the valleys, and then because of predation, they go up, and the bird sits in the in the treetop. The the herbivore, you know, gets up on a top where they can look out and see if the yeah. lions are coming. Yeah. Um, and, and so this 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 um, this eating in the valley, and then ruminating and pooping and peeing on the on the hilltop. Yeah. That that moves this gravitational fertility from the low ground to the high ground. Wow. Powerful. That, that's one of the it's one of the most uh, important functions that animals provide in nature. And, uh, and so uh, if we take the cows off of the grass and put them in a feedlot, if we take the chickens off of outdoors and confine them in a building, if we, if we violate any of those three M's, we're, we're taking what God intended as an asset and turning it into a liability. That's the thing that's important to remember. And maybe that, that research they're doing based on industrial mainstream agriculture is right. It is destroying the planet. Exactly. That conclusion is correct. Yeah. Is correct. Um, or, or that it's not healthy or whatever. Correct. Uh, that conclusion is correct, but they're, but they're studying an anti-ecological, anti-health, you know, anti-resilient system. Brilliant. Well, give a message of hope. People are listening out there. Talk about the African situation. I know you've just landed, but I'm sure you know what's happening out here. You've met sure. with Belinda from you know, the Permaculture Institute of South Africa yeah. for a while. Yeah. It's a privilege to have you here. But how can you see Africa? I mean, Africa sort of, I was speaking to Angus today, which is exciting. There's less governmental control to a large degree. There are a lot more freedoms here to a certain degree. So yes. it gives the average person out there an opportunity to have their own little patch or to buy from from a local farmer's market or to ensure where they buy is supporting the man on the ground, the farmer who's actually trying to yeah. produce correctly those products. Yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the things for sure is that when governments don't function very well, uh, they, they, they can't micromanage everything mm -hmm. because they just don't function yeah. very well. Is there corruption? Yeah, there certainly yeah. is corruption. But, but the fact is that a government that's in, that's in dysfunction mode simply is not efficient enough yeah. to keep up with everybody. Yeah. Uh, and so my message is uh, to, to uh, first of all, realize that your situation, um, uh, the, the, the way out, your path forward, is not dependent on everybody else clearing the path for you. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese have a saying that says, um, if if everyone would sweep in front of their own house, the whole world would be clean. And, and I think that that's the way we need to view um, uh, uh, Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He describes the spheres of influence. So he's got, he's got three concentric mm -hmm. circles. And the first one is the things that I can control. Yeah. These are things I can control. The next one is my sphere of influence. And then the outside one are things that are beyond my control. Yeah. And most of us spend all our time Frustrating, being angry, whatever, um, spending time on things that are beyond our control. And his point is that if you focus on what is within your control and you do that well, my dad used to say, lead it by example. You can't push on a string. Yeah. You have to pull on a string. You yeah. lead by example. If you focus on what's within your control and do that well, guess what happens to your sphere of influence? Yeah. It, it expands. It grows. And so my encouragement for folks is if you need to get it out of your system, take a pencil and paper and write down all the things that you hate about your country, about you know whatever's going on, right? Make Get it out of your system, all right? And then take a piece of paper and write down, here are things that I can control. Can I control what goes on my plate tomorrow? Can I control how my little patch of earth is handled? Can I control if, it, if, it, if soil builds there or not? Mm -hmm. Can I, you know... Yes, there are things that you control. And when you focus on that, then your positive energy will move and radiate out. And so you will become a haven of hope uh, for your neighbors and for your community. That's where we need to head. We're, we're hard, unfortunately, we're hardwired to, uh, to be prejudicially um, um, uh, fixated on the negative. Uh, that's why we call them stop lights and mm. not go lights. Nobody comes back from town and says, hey, sweetie, you know, I hit six go lights in yeah. town today. We remember what stops us, yeah. not what makes us go. Yeah. And so 
Uh, so my encouragement is to realize that that's the way we are hardwired. And so we have to actually work at um, uh, creating uh, a positive energy within our system to be able to make that, that, for, that, that positive progress. And, uh, you know, it, it's going to be different at a different scale, at a different pace, and actually a different protocol for every single person. But if we, if we concentrate on that, then um, we, we will absolutely be more successful in the things that matter most. Brilliant. That reminds me of Ubuntu. It's this African word, the spirit of community, I am, because we are, yeah. we are totally connected. And that serenity mm -hmm. prayer of God, give yeah, me the serenity to accept the things I cannot, cannot change, change and the courage to change the things I can. And the, and wisdom. the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. It's a powerful, powerful yeah. uh, prayer. Well, I want to declare favor and blessing over you, Thank that you. you would thrive in everything God has for you, mm. and that He would give you supernatural courage and anointing to fulfill the things that He, the good works that He's given to yes. you, for you, your children, and your children's children. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.